Hello, my name is Kristen and this is Kristen Craves Books. So, as you know, usually I do my wrap-ups to vlog style where when I finish a book or two or three or four, just depending on really how lazy I am or the time that I have, I will stop and record a little clip talking about the videos I've read and then put that all together for the end of the month. A couple of them are forgettable even though I enjoyed them in the moment and it just reminds me why I like to do the vlog style wrap-ups because my thoughts are fresh and now a month later it's hard to remember all the details and why I like something or why I didn't love it so much and I guess that's a good thing in some sense to see if a book has staying power because over time my thoughts on certain books does change but Anyways, I digress. This is what you're getting today, and I'm going to do this in order for my least favorite book, working up to my favorite, though I did have a few DNFs in the month, nothing that I can really remember. <laughs> it was just one of those things, I was in such a weird reading mood that I was starting things and just never continuing with them, so no hard DNFs, just a strange reading month in terms of trying to figure out what I was in the mood for. So we've got a diverse range of genres here, and let's just dive into it. So my least favorite book of the month is not a bad book by any means. I gave it three stars. I just think I hyped it up in my head and this is A Marvelous Light by Freya Marsky. This is a historical romance but there is a light fantasy element to it as we are following these two characters, Robin and what's his name? Edwin? Yes. And Robin is accidentally hired into this position where he's going to be like an administrator for someone who has magic and he had no idea that magic even existed and through a series of events he gets a curse placed upon him and Edwin who is now his boss and future love interest is helping him break this curse but they have great banter. I think for me I think I saw some people say that they felt that this was slow burn but I wanted it to be even more slow burn because it is a standalone within a longer series like the typical romance thing where this couple story is wrapped up in this book and then we follow a different couple in the same world within the same group and their romance. So this one wraps up and it just felt too fast for me. They got together too fast for me. We lost some of that banter. I don't mind when couples get together early on or like halfway through as long as they keep that banter going and I didn't feel like that was happening in this one. It was more they got together, then they start to question things like is this a really going to be a relationship that works? Oh no, he's got a curse on him. So there was that mystery of trying to break the curse, which I thought was interesting but wasn't what kept me reading. I liked the writing, I thought that the writing was strong, it really did feel like a historical romance. I don't know that the magic was really explained which doesn't bother me so much but I know a lot of people like to have that explained more. The focus of this was really the romance and it just wasn't my favorite romance ever at the end of the day but I did like them both as individuals. They did really stand out on their own. They had different personalities. The friend group that Edwin has is terrible and they're supposed to be unlikable but it was just kind of painful to read about them and I was excited for when they were off the page and there was like a level of predictability in this one for me like the whodunit kind of thing but it was good. I liked the writing as I said. I thought she captured this era pretty well and I'm curious to know if you've read this one if you continued on with the series and how you felt about the subsequent books and the characters that those books follow. I know that the next one is sapphic so I'm Curious to see if I will like that one more, but we will just have to see. So that is my least favorite, but still a good book. I then read Before We Say Goodbye by Tashikazu Kawaguchi, which is the fourth book in the Tales from the Cafe series. I read the first three books at the beginning of last year and I just marathon read them and I really liked that experience. Now a year later, I think that this fourth installment is probably going to be my last one. These are Japanese novels that are translated into English. I know that the fifth book is out, it just hasn't been translated yet and I don't think I'm going to pick it up and it's not that I don't like these books, I really do. I just think I've gotten everything I need to get out of them. You've probably heard these before, they are time travel books where the characters go into this cafe, they sit in a specific chair, they can go back in time and have a conversation with somebody who has been in the cafe in the past but they can't change the future in any way and those are the basic rules and have to come back before the coffee gets cold. And those are the basic rules and it's a series of short stories. So I think this last installment had four short stories in it and every short story we get the rules explained to us again because the character in the book doesn't know the rules because they're coming to that cafe for the first time but we as a reader we know we've heard it 
at least 20 times now by the fourth book because in every short story you get this explanation and it just felt tedious to me and I've cried through all of these but I feel like at this point I know what to expect in terms of how it's going to make me really emotional. The second story was about a dog so you know that that had me in tears but I just don't think that I need to continue on with this series. Again it's that repetitiveness that actually took me out of the story. It probably happens a lot in the first three but because I marathon read them and it was like a new experience for me it didn't bother me as much but it was really noticeable in this installment and I just couldn't get as invested and as I said I think I got all that I need from this series and I don't regret reading it or this book but I am happy with what I got and I'm done so that was good to know and I don't regret reading it at all. Next on my list is The Scourge Between Stars by Ness Brown. This is a sci-fi horror and I haven't read a sci-fi horror in a minute. It's one of my favorite subgenres. It's just hard to find. There's not a lot out there. There's especially not a lot diverse sci-fi horror out there. So I'm glad that I read this and it is a debut. It is not my favorite sci-fi horror. I think it is kind of tropey and you can see the similarities between some other stuff that's out there but I think that's fine. I think she did something interesting with it. This is a debut. I will read something else by Ness Brown, whatever she puts out next, because I thought that this was a fun read. It's not very long. The audiobook is fantastic. I listened to it in one sitting. It gave me everything that I needed. It is a horror novel that takes place on a spaceship, and it's a world where climate change has happened. Earth is no longer safe. These people have gone into space and tried to colonize another planet, but that did not go right. So they are going back to Earth and something happens and bodies are starting to pile up on this spaceship and our main character is investigating. And what happens was a little bit predictable, but I still thought it was awesome. And they're running out of rations and everything. So I thought there were some good conversation in here as well. And a lot of times in horror, I don't care about the main character so much, but in this case I did, which I thought was excellent for such a short book. And it is plot driven, but because I liked the character, I was invested. I gave it a high three stars because of just the predictability and some of that tropiness, but I had such a fun time with it. And that's just what I want in a sci-fi horror. And in some ways, I think that this could have been more horrific. It wasn't super, super scary. There was some gore and stuff but the tension wasn't as strong as you might expect, but great conversations, had a good time with it. If you have a couple hours to spare and you're a fan of sci-fi horror, I would give it a listen, I liked it. Then I read Ava Evergreen, Semi-Magical Witch by Julie A before the Black Hat Book Coven book club, and we have a full discussion about this book on Laura's channel. I will leave a link to that discussion down below. And I thought this was really cute. I gave it the highest rating of all of us, a four stars, and I think everybody else gave it a three. But it's a middle grade. I haven't read a middle grade in a minute, and I thought that this was really adorable. I loved Ava as a main character. I thought there were some really sweet messages in this. I really appreciated that Julie Abe trusted that her audience, a middle grade audience, could handle the content in this. There's some higher stake, like world altering stakes in here. It's not something small, and that's a lot of pressure to put on a 12 year old. But you have to think as a middle grade reader, you don't want to read about somebody like you just sitting at home doing homework, going through school and all that stuff. I mean, sometimes you do, you want to. But if you're picking up a fantasy as a 12 year old, you want to see a 12 year old in maybe some unrealistic situations because she is a witch who has to go through some testing in a town with no adult supervision away from her parents at 12 years old. But as a kid, you would love that, right? I feel like that's what you kind of want to read about. So it makes sense to me for the audience that this is intended for and I love that trope when a witch isn't that great at her magic and that is Ava. She didn't come into her magic until late and nobody really believes that she is very capable and she proves herself through this book and she makes friendships and it's in a small town. There's some baked goods and my cat is trying to get my attention. Oh, and the best part, I almost forgot, there is this creature here named Ember who is a fox flame. And Julia Abe was born in Japan and moved to America and you can really see some of those Japanese influences in here. If you're a fan of Studio Ghibli, like Kiki's Delivery Service in particular, I think you should check this out. I'm gonna put this in a little free library in my neighborhood because there was a lot of kids 
in this neighborhood and I think they will think that this is really sweet and fun and maybe relate to it a little bit. So I will definitely read the sequel at some point, not a high priority, but I will get to it and it was sweet. I then read the last two novellas in the Holiday with the Wongs series from Jackie Lau. I read the first two in November, saved these last two for February because each of them centers around a holiday and both of the holidays in these books happened in February. So the first one is a fake girlfriend for Chinese New Year and this is a really cute one. I am a sucker for the fake dating trope and I liked that we got more of the family shenanigans in this one because in the first book all of the siblings are at Thanksgiving and they've all been set up by their parents and their grandparents and it just goes terribly. And that is why our main character wants to bring a fake girlfriend to Chinese New Year because he doesn't want that to happen to him again and it's a friend to lovers because the fake girlfriend is somebody that he's become close to. They are like friends at the bar. So that's sweet and she's always kind of been pining for him. I kind of wish it was the reverse. I'm more of a he falls first kind of fan but it was still cute. It was more of a slow burn than some of the others in this book. I liked this brother in particular. I think the thing with this series is it's all going to come down to what tropes you like and what kind of heroes and main characters you like. If you like a cinnamon roll, you'll love one book. If you love a grump, you'll love another. If you like like a chauvinistic guy, you'll like a different one. So it really depends on that. And then the last one, I think it's called A Big Surprise for Valentine's Day, was probably my least favorite just because it was more about like a friends with benefits thing. So it was steamier than the other ones. Even though they're all steamy, it just starts with that right away because they've been hooking up throughout a couple of these books. We just didn't know it. It was happening behind the scenes. So this is following the sister of the three brothers of the first one and she is hooking up with one of the brother's best friends. And obviously they're hiding it for obvious reasons and they break up and then they get back together and do they have real feelings for each other. And yeah, it just wasn't my favorite, but so glad I read that series. I'm reading a Jackie Lyle book this month. I am definitely a new fan of hers and she keeps releasing books and I keep wanting to read them. So great author to find and a great little series to read. If you're looking for a series of novellas and you like steamy romances, they are super Canadian. I say this every time, but they're set in Ontario where I'm from and they're just so Canadian. Lots of Tim Hortons references, lots of them and I'm here for it. Then I actually read an anthology. I always put anthologies on my TBR or on my most anticipated release videos because there's so many that are out there that are interesting but I never read them. But I actually got to one this year and it's called Relit and it is edited by Sandra Proudfoot and this is a series of stories that are written by Latinx authors and they take these classic stories and kind of modernize them. And the first story in this collection was probably my favorite just because it has everything that I love. It's Pride and Prejudice in Space. And you have to listen to the audiobook for this one because I thought the audiobook is really well, well done. Our main character is a social media influencer who's in space and her audience is back on Earth. So she's telling everybody what's happening on here. There's a Darcy character that she doesn't like. She trashes him on the internet. He sees it, kind of confronts her about it, but he's into her, obviously. It's Mr. Darcy. And we get some fun reveals and some space stuff and a lot of it is just told through her videos. She does live streams so we get like the live stream transcripts which I thought was a fun take and I just thought it was a fun short story. I would actually read a whole book like that but it's not one of those things where I think we needed a full book. I actually think that it was perfect as is. There are a few other standouts in there for me. I love the one about Jane Eyre. The Great Gatsby one was really good. The Frankenstein one. I also really liked the one about the Little Mermaid. So you're taking these classic stories and putting a twist on them, which is obviously something I have discovered I really like. And you're giving the characters new voices and new identities. And it was just really strong for me. Not every story was a hit, but a lot of them were. And I highly recommend the audiobook for that one and just listening to a story or two at night. It's fun. If you've heard purring this entire video, I'm sorry. This little girl is needy lately. I don't know what it is, but she always wants to be around me purring, but obviously hates to be held and doesn't want to be in video right now. But the next book is What Feast at Night by T. Kingfisher. My first T. Kingfisher of the year. I don't know what took me so long to get to something from her, but this is her newest release. It's very short. It's a sequel to What Moves the Dead, which was the first horror of hers I read and is probably still my favorite. If you read the first one, I don't think you need to pick up the sequel. That one obviously is a standalone. I think a lot of us were surprised it was even getting a sequel. These are very episodic in nature and if that is not something you like, I don't think you should pick this up. I understand it's not going to be for everybody. 
a lot of people will think it's unnecessary, but I had a good time with it. It's T. Kingfisher, what can I say? I like this character, Alex. They're going to their family manor, which they haven't been doing in a long time. They have complicated feelings about their hometown, but they go there and they realize that the caretaker is dead and the manor's in disarray and there's a lot of rumors swirling around about what's happening at the manor. And that's all you really need to know. If you read the first book, it was all about mushrooms. If you read this one, it's all about moths. Though I will say that I don't think this one was as scary. I just don't think that the moth stuff was as scary to me as the mushrooms. I don't know why. And it's a lot about dreams and for some reason that doesn't always scare me that much. I feel like there's a distance when you make it a dream thing. Like you can take a step back and think is it real? Is it not? It's not as terrifying to me personally. But I loved a lot of the conversations that we touched on in the first book that I felt like we really expanded on. And this one, our main character was a soldier in this fictional world and we get a lot of conversations about PTSD. That is a lot of where the dreams come from. That is a lot of the conversation around, is this really happening or is this my trauma? And for a short book, we really dug deep into that and I appreciated those conversations. And I do like this cast of characters and if we're getting more of these, I'd be happy though. I understand not everybody's gonna agree with that. Next is The Man Who Died Twice by Richard Oseman. This is the sequel to The Thursday Murder Club and I'm budding reading this whole series. And I'm so happy that I continued on with this series because I read The Thursday Murder Club a year or two ago and I liked it but didn't love it. It was just not something that I was prioritizing. But this particular group of friends that loves the series so much got the FOMO, decided to buddy read it with them all, and the second book is so much better than the first. If you liked the first one, but you didn't feel connected to the characters, or you didn't think the mystery was that strong, you still have to try book two. It gets so much better. I could not believe how attached I was to these characters. I cried. It was so emotional, but so hilarious. I love their friendship. Some great reveals as well. I do think that the mystery in this one was a lot stronger, and their connections and friendships just get deeper, which I know is just gonna break my heart. We are following these characters in like a retirement community and they meet every Thursday to talk about cold cases and in both books, they end up in a mystery themselves. That's all you need to know about this. It's a great big cast of characters who at first it's hard to distinguish between, but by this book, I know them all well. I love them all individually. I love their friendships. I love the way that they interact with one another and their sense of humor. Some are more blunt than others. It's just a grand old time. Love it so much. Gonna read the third one in March at some point. Read the fourth one in April and cry my eyes out. So I'm ready for it. And then we have one that I read at the beginning of the month and it feels so long ago but I still love it. I think I might even love it more now that I've had some distance from it. And this is Where the Dark Stands Still by A.B. Pornak. This is an arc that I had, so it would have just come out recently. If you like some of the fantasy stuff that I like, you have to pick this up. You might think that it's cozy. It's not that cozy. There's actually some moments in here that are quite graphic and horrific and lean towards horror in some ways, but I loved that about it. If you like sentient houses, this is like the perfect sentient house. The sentient house in this it's actually showing our main character secrets and hiding things from our Dark Lord character because the house is scared of him. So we're following Liska who has some kind of magical powers, but in her village, this is historical, obviously being a witch is looked down upon. So something traumatic happens, something horrible happens, and we don't know what at the beginning. And it opens with her on the run in this enchanted forest looking for this magical fern where it will grant you one wish and her wish is to no longer have magical powers but instead she stumbles upon this character who is the dark lord and makes a deal with him where she will live at his house in servitude for a year and then he will grant her wish but really he wants to help break out her magic and they have an enemies to lovers kind of thing going on but it's a very very slow burn romance and Every other element about it is actually more interesting to me than the romance. It's one of those romances where he's 18 but has been alive for 700 years and she's just 18. And it always takes me a minute to wrap my head around that but I think that this book was self-aware and I appreciated that. But Liska as a main character I love. She's probably going to be one of my favorite characters of the year. You learn about her childhood and all the pain that her magic has caused her and why she is suppressing her magic and why her magic is hard for her to find and when it does happen it's explosive. So 
love that. I love, there's like a cat in here that is more of a house witch kind of thing. Just some really great elements in here. The house itself is a character. Always love that. There's a part at the end, not at the very end, the very end, I can't even talk about it. Just know that this author doesn't do things that are predictable. You won't be able to predict everything that happens in here and that was kind of refreshing. But it has everything that I love. Definitely one that I need a finished copy of. As you know, I love this cover so much and I'm so happy that I loved the content inside as well. Okay, two more. And choosing between these two has been so difficult that they're both contemporary romances. They both made me cry. Read them both in a day. Love them so much. How do I choose? I think, okay, I'm gonna go with Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan, but if you ask me tomorrow, the order of these two might be different, but I love Kennedy Ryan, one of my best discoveries of last year. I've read quite a few of her books at this point. As I'm filming this, the sequel to Before I Let Go came out today. I will be downloading the audiobook and listening to that because I loved the first one on audio. You have to know going into this one about the content warnings because it is about child loss and stuff around pregnancy. So that'll be very difficult. It happens on page through a flashback, you get the details. And then we're talking about the fallout from that event and how this has affected Yasmin and her marriage, the depression that she goes through, how it's affected her children and everything around that. And we open up with them divorced. They own a restaurant together. The husband's name is Josiah. We also get his POV, which I appreciated. And them having this undeniable love for each other, but some bitterness there on his side because she left him, but they are pulled to one another. She still has feelings for him, that whole thing. So it's an emotional roller coaster. It's a tearjerker for sure. I just always trust Kennedy Ryan with these kind of topics. She's very realistic and sensitive and she writes really authentic characters and relationships that aren't perfect. They aren't messy. Do these characters belong together? Maybe, maybe not, but it feels real. The feelings feel real. I think a lot of women in particular will feel seen by this book. The conversations around going to therapy where we actually see some of these characters in the therapy sessions and them having realizations about themselves and the mistakes they made and why maybe that this marriage didn't work. Brilliant. Loved it. Loved hearing about the kids. I know a lot of people really didn't like the daughter. She's a teenager and she has um, a pretty tumultuous relationship with Yasmin, her mother, but I feel like I understood where she was coming from even though she was wrong. Again, it's just another example of how Kevin Ryan can write real people who are imperfect and have a lot of growing to do. And we see them grow throughout the book, but they never become the ideal person because that, that person just does not exist. We all make mistakes and we all say things that we regret and we all have room for growth. So I just, oh, I love Kennedy Ryan. I think she's a genius. Speaking of genius, my favorite book of February, I'm pretty confident in saying this, is A Love Song for Ricky Wilde by Tia Williams. This is beautiful. This is a romance, but it's also magical realism. And I think you have to know that going in the back kind of hints to it, but I think a lot of readers would pick this up thinking it's going to be like seven days in June and not being prepared for that magical realism element. And the thing with magical realism or light fantasy is you really have to suspend your disbelief. You just have to go with it, which is something that I'm fine with, but I know might not be for every reader. We're following Ricky Wilde. She's part of like a dynasty in Atlanta. Her family's really wealthy and they have certain expectations. She's always been the black sheep, more artistic and not really wanting to go on the path that her parents and her sisters have gone on and she meets somebody. She has this opportunity to move to Harlem and open a flower shop in this brownstone, which has always been her dream. So we see her relationship with this older woman who has become like a surrogate grandmother to her and has given her this brownstone and their relationships are really endearing and sweet and she learns a lot from her. It jumps through some time and we see her form friendships and really come into her own in Harlem while also struggling and she meets a man. She meets a man that she can't resist. They have this kind of confrontation where he says stop following me and so she starts like going out of her way, leaving the neighborhood to go to different grocery stores or different parks and stuff like that and still sees him everywhere. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. I think you have to discover it for yourself. Just know that that magical realism element is there and be prepared for it, but also be prepared for just stunning writing, real characters, a good cry, 
so beautiful. It was worth the wait. I know a lot of us were waiting for something new from Tia Williams after the popularity of Seven Days in June, and I think it was worth it. I think I like this one even more, but I will say that these are set in the same universe, and I'll just leave it at that. So, loved it. As I talk about these books, I realized that I did have a pretty good reading month in February. Some standouts there between all of the romances that I read. A Tea King Fisher, you can't go wrong with that. The Where the Dark Stand Still really is a highlight for me, so I can't complain. Uh, it is March 5th. I know I'm late doing this because I thought I could edit all my clips together for my vlog and then I didn't and I haven't had a chance to sit down and film this till now but it's March 5th. I've read four books already for March for Ramathon. It's not too late to join Ramathon and join Team Creation so I hope to talk to you in the comments. Thank you again for your support. I'll talk to you all soon. Bye for now.